Hey, real estate agents, welcome to Making a Smarter Agent, your program to find out all the tips and trends as told by the great ones in real estate. What's a great one? Someone that's able to make money and still keep their head on straight. Let's face it, this is a tough business. We interview tough people who seem to make it look easy. And without further ado, I want to get to our guest, Jennifer Leahy. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us a little bit about you. How did you know, where'd you come from? How did you get started in real estate? So let's see, where did I come from? How did I get started? So I grew up sort of in development in some way. My mom's boyfriend for 10 years was a big real estate developer in Manhattan. And um, so I think that I was always sort of in real estate. And then my first, well, not my first, but one of my first jobs, I was actually a domestic violence counseling a victim advocate is my first job, but my second job was at a luxury mortgage bank. So I was a mortgage broker for many years before I went into education. And then after I was in education for I don't know five or five or so years, I came back to the real estate market and as a real estate agent for Douglas Elliman about five years ago. So that's a long-winded way of kind of telling my story. I didn't just do real estate my whole life, but I've always sort of had one foot in it. Sure, but but you you got into actual sales, you would say five years, five ago, years ago in real estate sales, and yep. and yep. wow, and so and you you shot up as superwoman in that time. <laughs> well. It was I, both um, a question and a statement. So notice how I slipped that in there. I want to, you know, it's so fine. You don't, you don't have to brag. I'll brag for you. You are a superwoman. You're doing phenomenally well. When you got into it, now you've started a team. You've grown that out. I want to touch on that just a little bit. But tell me about, you know, when did you really get your sea legs? Like, was it, were, you, were you making money after your first year, after your second year? Like, without getting too far into your personal business, when did you consider yourself successful in this? Well, I was rookie of the year the first year. So I, I would say I, I hit the ground running. I probably, I, I definitely was working 70 hours my first year of real estate. Not a question. Um, so, and, you know, I started the Douglas Solomon office in Greenwich. So there was actually no brick and mortar the first year that I was in real estate for Douglas Solomon. And for some crazy idea, reason, I don't know, Howard thought that, it was a good idea for me without ever selling a piece of real estate to uh, to start for him. But I guess it worked out. Um, but I think, you know, I worked 70 hour weeks and I pounded the pavement, and called everyone I knew and made a big um, splash. And I, my first uh, public open house was a um, petting zoo and pony rides. I think that sort of helped put me on the map because people thought that was crazy. It's a crazy idea. I that's I, I love petting zoos. I, I, I would love pony fun. rides if I was smaller. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much fun. There's so much fun. I can't I can't ride a pony, but the petting zoo how creative is that? That's wonderful. Uh and, mm. and so you put your time in, you met the folks, you started to sell, you you hit the ground running right from the get go. Did you have a plan when you got started? Uh my plan was to make money. So okay. I think um, my plan was to make money and my plan was to work as hard as possible for anyone who gave me the chance. And I think that, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that I, you know, have these elaborate business plans that I do now and that I require my teammates to have, but I certainly in my head, I knew what I wanted to accomplish. Like I knew how many houses I wanted to sell and I think by naming it and saying, okay, I'm going to close at least 10 houses my first year, um, you know, you, you manifest what you put out there. And so I think that that, you know, that does help. Sure. I, it, it's interesting. I just spoke with, uh, with uh, Ivan Estrada, whose who's interview will air next week. And I had Paul Zwiebman on and I've got others coming up. And the thing, there's a pattern the, the motivational speakers say success leaves clues and knowing you personally and having our, our chats on uh, Elm and retreats, I know that you live by a routine. I know that you will enjoy, uh, or I should say live by meditation. Talk to me about that. How, how ritualistic 
are you in both personal and business and, and how does that help you? Um, so I am very routine oriented. Um, even though I'm also spontaneous, I say, I think I'm a little bit of a dichotomy. Um, I start my day off the same way every day. So I started off with 20 minutes of transcendental meditation. Uh, as the years have progressed, it's sort of evolved, but now I do Tony Robbins priming and then Napoleon Hill statement. Um, so every morning that's how I start. And then with, uh, two prayers after that. So, and that's without fail every day. Um, and then I have a list of things that I want to accomplish every day and I don't stop working until I have them accomplished. Um, I think that that's sort of, you know, if, if I know the guidelines, I know the rules by which I'm going to play every day. And if I don't get them accomplished, uh, I won't go to sleep until they're done. So sure. well, that's you know, what, 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 what time do you, what time do you get up? What, what time does this um, I get up uh, morning start? Okay. Well, it's usually, so my son wakes me up, um, usually around 5, 55 AM with snuggle. <laughs> and so we snuggle until six and then he goes and watches the show. And I have, my routine is about 30 minutes in the morning. Um, and my daughter gets up probably just thereafter. So he, she hears him. And so they're all downstairs by six and mommy's doing her morning routine. Um, so from six to six thirty is my time to set the day. You know, I don't look at my phone or anything when I first wake up. Um, and then at six thirty, it's kid time until school. And then I'm usually off to the races with work and fit in a workout at some point, five days a week, usually. Um, and I typically go to bed depending on how busy I am between 10 and midnight. Wow. And, and no Netflix gets in there. No, I don't watch TV. No, no, no TV. Okay, <laughs> that, that, okay. Make note, agents. This is listened to largely by by agents across the country. That you, you know, you can do what you want, but the top producers don't waste their time with this stuff. They really just get right into the work. Talk to me about making the telephone ring. You know, a lot of people are saying, "Yeah, that's great. You put the seventy hours in." But the thing that I found when talking to different agents is they don't know how to get started. They don't know where uh, to put the majority of their time. Do you, do you have any goals that you set as far as what tasks are going to be performed and when? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's all about income producing activities, but I'm lucky that I, I, I really, I love my job and I live a very joyful life. So for me, you know, contacting friends or contacting past clients or going places where I know I'll see people that may need my help or want my advice is very joyful. I don't do anything during my day um, that will not help um, expand my joy. And that's not to say that I don't have difficult clients. I have to make difficult phone calls because surely those are part of my day, but those make me better. So I look at if I have a client who's particularly challenging or has a personality type that's hard for me, I look at it as a process of me becoming a better person by figuring out what language to use to help influence that person to, you know, whatever they need to do in order to protect their assets. So if I'm representing a client that's particularly difficult for me to talk to, how do I influence them so that they feel good about the decision that we're making together, which will help in the end protect their asset by either, and I know this seems counterintuitive, but by doing a price reduction, because the sooner we do a price reduction, the sooner I can get it sold, the sooner they're going to get the highest price, especially now in Connecticut, since it's a buyer's market. I'm really just... Um, pounding the pavement and trying to get all my inventory sold as quickly as possible. Uh, you, do you th any predictions? Do you think this is going to be ongoing? Yeah, the, I, think the ongoing. In the I don't think we've hit, you know, I don't think we've hit the bottom yet. I don't think it's going to be Armageddon, but I think, um, you know, I think that we're in a declining market. It's an awesome time to buy. Um, and if you're a seller who's realistic, you're going to get your house sold. And, you know, at this point as a fiduciary, it's my responsibility to be honest. I don't, you know, I'm not going to pretend I think a house is worth more than it is because I'm just hurting that, you know, my client's asset. And I think when I pivoted this year and really started taking that seriously, I would feel, I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving a conversation if I hadn't been totally honest about pricing. Because as agents, especially if you're already mostly agents, we all know sometimes you feel like kind of backed into a corner. The clients are aggressive about their price. You think you're going to lose the listing. Well, I'll tell you what, it's better to lose a listing than be a fiduciary who's not telling the truth. 
because uh, you know that's a that's a very you have a lot of responsibility as a real estate agent and anyone who doesn't feel that way is not doing their job right sure when, when we don't know anyone who's not doing their job right i say that with total sarcasm <laughs> i'm just saying you, <laughs> we just we oh, don't get a lot of people that, that that take well look i mean people <laughs> like you and that's that's the result of I, I always try and take the high road as well. I'm a working agent too, and and I think that's that's kudos to you. That's great. Uh, that's great to to know. Hey, real estate agents, are you looking to grow your business bigger than you ever imagined? Well, you need Rain Nation. Rain Nation is a think tank comprised of realtors for realtors. It's part group therapy, part coaching all opportunity. Just go to Rain Nation on Facebook. That's R-E-I-G-N-A-T-I-O-N and sign up there. As far as like when people discover you, well, let's talk about this now that the market shifted. Are you spending more time with buyers and sellers? Like w w w break down the revenue. Where is it coming from? Mostly sellers, mostly buyers, a combination of the two? How does so that I've work? Lucky. I've always been 50-50. So I think my business and my team will remain 50-50. We might go a little bit more buyer head heavy in 2020, um, but you know we'll probably on our high period in a year we'll have 50 listings. Right now we're getting towards where we've gotten rid of most of our a lot of our inventory that's going to sell this year. So I think we're down to like maybe 25 or 30 listings um, as they rotate out. But um, we'll do just as many buyers. So we're pretty even. On both sides. That's great. And as far as what's making the phone ring, let's let's go into both. As far as the buyers, is that typically a sphere of influence type of person that's coming to you, or are they looking at your ads? Are you doing Zillow? Um, like, what are what are some of the ways that the phone's ringing? Um, I do get a lot of calls from Zillow. I don't. I'm not a. I don't pay Zillow to do that. I do that. I, Zillow. I naturally get phone calls from them because I, I think of my um, success. Um, I, I don't know what else it would be because I, I don't pay them extra. Um, but I get I do a ton of business off of my social media. Um, mm -hmm. I sell millions of dollars of real estate that way. Um, my sphere of influence, is, of course, my past clients, of course, and then of course uh, public open houses. You know, my team—they're some of the best you know agents around. So you know, we convert pretty much anyone who's coming unrepresented. If we're not converting them, I'm not going to be very happy. Sure. What What about like agents from other states, Douglas Elman or otherwise? Has that ever been a lead source for you? Oh yeah. I mean, we're yeah. Uh, of course. Uh, Thank you, everyone who refers me. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate everyone who refers me. <laughs> yes, we're, yeah. we're both we're both we're both giving you a virtual hug right now. You don't see it, <laughs> but we feel it. No. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm so appreciative of all my Douglas Elman family. Actually, I, I have to say, I think spending time with um. The DE family has been a major source of uh, referrals and income, and it's uh, been such a, an, a, it's amazing. I'm very lucky. You, you, well, you have something about you, just to go off script just a bit here. I mean, you, you pe people lighten up beautifully when they see you, and there's something that's very, wow. very sociable and why people want to be around you. And I, I, you know, that's something I wish you could bottle it. I wish I could advise Aww. this to the people that come on my think tanks about just that you'd be a great example of just how it, there's something about it. And people want to do business with, with people that make them happy. Right. It, it's just, you Aww. know, a lot better than work, working so with the nice. jerk. Oh, yeah, well, no, it's, it's that's, true. That's very nice. But it is that every, not every interaction can be, but I really try, you know, that every interaction can, you know, be a good one. Yeah. Okay. You know? So let's here, here we got top Top Gun or Big Shot in Connecticut starts an office without even having an office is in number one or rookie of the year the first year. We're fast forwarding a few years. When did you get your team started? Um, so my team started. I think it was like March, March, April of this year, 2019. Um, mm -hmm. We're oh, so, so of this year. So this is this is uh, this is you're still new this at is this. The first year. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. so I, I spent a lot of time, you know, from the get-go, people had really said, oh, you should start a team, you should start, well, not everyone, but most people said that I should start a team. And quite frankly, the way that I work, I'm so methodical that I have to think about everything over and over and see all the different iterations and how I'm going to make people successful and what kind of plan am I going to use for them and what kind of scaffolds are we going to have and what kind of system. So you really do take me the full, you know, four years of, going through things and making a ton of mistakes before I felt comfortable um, being responsible for a team. So now I have five agents and two assistants, um, and I'm so proud of all of them. The agent who's been with me the longest, his, um, you know, she'll close, I don't know, more than five million this year. We'll see where the year ends, but uh, probably could get close to 10. Um, And everyone's brand new on my team. So, yeah, she's amazing. Um, And, um, yeah, everyone, uh, next year, I don't think anyone's goals are really less than $10 each. Um, And all the tools to enable them to be able to do that. So I'm really proud of them. And uh, I think the team this year will close, I don't know, between 15 and 16. We've already closed it. I think 50 and 60 we've closed i think we've closed 50 we're somewhere around there sure what well, you know so this person that's doing might do 10 million without sounding you know like what are you bringing to the table but but why do they choose to work with you as opposed to working independently with with douglas Elman or any other agency for that matter what are they getting from yeah, you? Um, uh, I, i'm coaching my teammates every day so the okay. um, the woman that I'm talking about was, you know, I've coached her every day, all day, and fielded every question, um, gave her all the systems that she needs to be successful, a ton of scripts um, for every different mm-hmm. situation, um, any every marketing plan you could want, every iteration of it in letters. So it was pretty much like, it's kind of handed on the silver platter, but I have a very specific type of person that would, that I have on my team. And, um, you know, I think, um, I'm, I'm very blessed to have put together a group as fantastic as the one that I have. Amazing. Amazing. And, and as far as their routine, are you encouraging them to meditate and do the rituals that you're doing? Is that part of the coaching? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, whatever that means to them and then also encouraging them to do the things that I didn't do right, you know, uh, taking a day off. I'm still not great with it, but um, getting better, Um, you know, and I think, you know, the stuff that's annoying to everyone, you need someone to say, hey, listen, you don't like the door knock. I get it. But guess what? You got a door knock. Where are you going to go? I'll drop you off. Like I'll, I'll door knock the other side of the street. You know, oh, you don't like to send letters. I know. I get it. I don't like to send letters either. Let's talk about the letters we're going to write. So, you know, it's nice to have um, a partner in crime. It's nice to have someone who encourages you to be your best self, even when it's uncomfortable. So, so, so no, that, that's, that's really good. So you still door knock. I mean, you're a $50, yeah, $50 million dollar leader here and you door. We say, of course, a lot of people yeah, don't. That's why, you know, I'm curious. Okay. So, so you door yeah, knock, like you letter write. You, <laughs> that, you, that, <laughs> my favorite part of real estate is making money. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, but but you'd be but, hard pressed to not know, get a listing, by doing it. <laughs> well, it, it, but there's still many many different ways that that people do it. I I love throwing events, and that's been a big win for me. Do you cold call at all? Yeah, we all cold call, of course. Okay. But, you know, it's hard for me because okay. cold calling for me. I've lived in this area for so long. It's inevitable that whoever I'm cold calling, like a Bisbo, Byron, I probably know them in some way, or it's like oh. You know, Cindy's brother's uncle, I knew you, like, oh, I went to school with your nephew. Like, it's, you know, I've been in Connecticut for so long, and my Westchester team has been in Westchester for so long. But it's, um, you know, there's, the world is a small place. So I, I guess right. I always look at, you know, everything is not really that cold. Sure. What do you do for the homeowners? You know, walk me through that for a second. Are are they all being advertised online? Are you having open houses? Do you leave in open houses? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're very aggressive with open houses, very aggressive with online. 
I'll pay for everything online that I can possibly get my hands on if I think it's effective, whether it's a Google ad, a Zillow ad, Boosts, um, Facebook, Instagram. Um, we're you know, posting across all platforms in different ways that we found to be the most effective, um, depending on the age of the demographic that I think is going to be buying it. And in some instances, I still, you know, and I, I still do magazines and, and I do newspapers, especially if it's for uh, downsizers, they will come to houses with newspapers in their hands. Um, public open houses were huge. Everyone on my team does, uh, you know, at least one or two a weekend. Actually, everyone does two a weekend. Um, and then we, you know, we do extended hours, twilight open houses, broker open houses. This week we're doing a broker open house and we've got like a ton of coupons and stuff and, and free giveaways from local businesses. So agents, if them or their clients or whomever wants to stop by can come by and get some free stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and then do some women's events. Yeah, Amazing. there's, I mean, no, you know, I'll, constantly I'll, doing stuff. All, all, all of this sounds really good. Do you track it with the CRM, or are you like, are you, are you a CRM person? Somebody asked me that I the hate other day. CRMs, I but yeah, I use, yeah, I literally <laughs> hate CRMs, but I use the CRM, okay. of course. So what, what, what yeah. can do? Tell what are you using? Um, I using Wise and use contextually. And use I hate contextually. them both and, equally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you don't discriminate. That's, you heard it here first, folks, on uh, making a smarter agent. Jennifer Lane, oh my God. takes them equally. Uh, what, what, yeah, what, what, yeah. It, it, there is a love hate. I mean, it's hard to get users to adopt it, right? To be able to get your staff to uh, to want to chime in on it and stuff. Well, and just pay someone who does. Like that's my my thing. If I, if I don't like to do it, then I have to pay people to do the things I don't like to do. So okay. you know, I mean, if it's not a, if it's not an income producing activity like entering stuff into a CRM, um, then I'm okay with paying someone else to do it. You know, sure. you can't farm out talking to someone that you want to get business with, right? You can't farm out, you know, socializing or cold calling, um, but you, you can farm out, you know, um, making, you know, graphic designing and farm out entering into CRMs. Sure. But so there's two other areas that I definitely want to touch on before we conclude. We do have a little while left, but one of them we talked about social media. The other one is about advertising. I want to ask you about budgets. And again, if you don't want to give your budget, you don't have to. But is there a ratio or some type of percentage of uh, GCI that you wind up spending on your marketing for mailing or for? for yeah. A lot. I'm not, gonna, we'll, leave yeah. it, we'll leave it at a lot. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Probably too much. Too much. How much money or time do you put into social media, and what channels are you on? I think the the audience would benefit from that. Uh, I put the most money and time probably in social media. Um, you know, because that is the advertising. Uh, that's a majority of the advertising. Not uh, not only my own, but just uh, ads, et cetera, on social media platforms. So I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, Twitter I've gone on and off with, but um, yeah, I don't think that – I've never made any money from my real estate career from Twitter, but I certainly have from Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn. Okay, so that's the, the, LinkedIn's the bastard stepchild that no one loved. At least that's how I always think of it. With uh, <laughs> within social media, you're the first person to tell me that they've they've made money off of LinkedIn. Yeah, that's like it, it, it's. It, you know what? That is. Um, LinkedIn is awesome, and it's just because you, people ha aren't tracking enough data on it. I get thousands of views on every one of my posts. So when I started tracking the data across Facebook and Instagram, I could see my data analytics on those. And then I posted on LinkedIn, I, don't know, I think it was like number one a couple of years ago, and I posted it, and I was floored on how many people looked at it. And LinkedIn is where all of my friends who are titans of industry are. They're not on Facebook and Instagram. It's like when you ask me, do I watch TV? It's like with what time? I mean, so I look at, you know, my LinkedIn, people who are just on LinkedIn is because they are professional and they're running, you know, this fund or running this company. And that's the only social media outlet they're really using. So um, it's 
so important. I mean, especially if your sphere of influence is people who run the world. Um, I think that I really do think LinkedIn is so powerful. It, it, yeah, I, I've always, always felt that it could be, but again, it, it's just like one of the first times when you say thousands of years, how many people are you connected to on LinkedIn? Um, I don't know. I definitely more than a thousand. Uh, uh, this mm. is a question. I'm not sure exactly how many, but a lot. And it's all people, um, you know, it's, it's just professional. So now I'm not going to do the same videos. I mean, anyone who follows me on Facebook knows that, hi, like I'm not putting one of those videos up on my LinkedIn, but you know, if I'm on uh, but I like your high. I, I like hey. the hand wave and the high. Hey. This is like your, this, that's your tag. That's, that's hey. like, you, you can't make a video without that high. Everyone always says, hey. in fact, I even said, you ever watch Jennifer's video and they all go, hi. And, and, you know, so, no, I think, I think it's great stuff. I, but I, I do, stuff. that's where like I'll, I'll, I might put up an article or if I'm on, uh, you know, uh, CNBC or, you know, one of them, like, oh, let's see if, if I've done something uh, like newsworthy, I'll, I'll put it up. Or if there's something that's going on in the state of Connecticut in Worcester that I think is important, um, if they're market reports, um, I'll put those up on LinkedIn. So you have to pivot on the content, but the content between Facebook and Instagram has to be different as well. So, you know, yeah, you, no, it's not it's, all the same. So of the 70 hours that you put in, or maybe you're not doing 70 anymore, but for whatever – Time frame. Can you give us a percentage of time that's spent on social media marketing for you personally, not um, for a staff member? Uh, okay, so that's a good question. So I, I'm going to cheat mm -hmm. a little bit because this is the first year that I do have um, one of my assistants helping me so that I'm not constantly doing it because um, I do have two small children. I'm on a board and, and I'm a commissioner. So um, I'd say. Before it was probably, if I work 10 hours in a day, mm -hmm. it was probably at least 20% of my day was spent on social media. Yeah. Two That's hours? Yeah, That's and now it's less because I have someone else that's doing it. But, you know, curating okay. the content, make sure, I mean, you know, it's like if I could give agents a simple tip, it's like every day go on and it's like connect with five people. My own team, sure. I tell them, it's like, go on, connect with five people and, you know, every day, make sure that you've expanded your network. Sure. And it, all of your stuff, is it all business or do we have anything with, I've seen you as Wonder Woman a couple times online. I know that for a fact. I don't know the yeah, talent connected to you. So, Maybe. so you, you, yeah. you, you could be, you're, you're, you're not all business. You could be fun. Yeah, I mean, no, I think it's, it's not important all for business. people to see that. Yeah. yeah, no, it's not all business. Yeah. It's definitely like I live a full life. You know, I'm not just a real estate agent. I'm a mom. You know, I'm a meditator. I'm on the board of David Lynch Foundation. I'm mm -hmm. in zoning in Connecticut, um, Darian. And, you know, so all of those things sort of are, you know, they add up to the person that's me. So I think it's important for people to see that. Well, you're you're living very very well, and I think that uh, you know your your confidence and all of that shines through. I always look forward to uh, uh, the the meditation sessions that we've had at at corporate retreats. I think that that's just incredible incredible stuff. What you know, I'm going to volunteer some information at the end. What's the best way for people to reach you? Sure. So they can reach me on Facebook and Jennifer Leahy on Instagram, Jennifer Leahy Homes. LinkedIn is obviously Jennifer Leahy and JK Leahy on Twitter. Um, my email is Jennifer.Leahy, L-E-A-H-Y at element.com. And my cell phone is 917-699-2783. And I'm happy to help anyone who wants advice on social media, how to learn to meditate, or I'm a, you know, I was going through a divorce when I started my career and I'm a single mom, two kids, and happy to give anyone words of encouragement to how to figure this wild career out. And that, that is great. You know, look, and I always say to the people that are listening, success leaves clues. There's a lot that could be learned from, from Jennifer. She's incredibly generous. I will be putting her information up on the show notes and blasting this absolutely everywhere so that people could see. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining. I hope we can have you back sometime. Thank you, Edmund. I super appreciate it. It's great being on. Thank you for listening to Making a Smarter Agent. 
do me a favor. If you liked Making a Smarter Agent, please go to Apple Podcasts or any of the podcast services you might be listening through and give me five stars. If you didn't like it that much, then don't even bother. You don't need to say anything. Five stars is all that really works. I look forward to seeing you next time. And remember, connect with Rain Nation. That's R-E-I-G-N-A-T-I-O-N on Facebook. It's part think tank, part group therapy for realtors, all coaching, and it's affordable. Please tune in again next week to listen to another exciting episode of Making a Smarter Agent.